Hi hey everybody, uh, my name is Asun Martinez and I work in um, what well, San Sebastian, my hometown um, in the north of Spain, in the Basque Country. And I'm the language coordinator for Spanish uh, for USAC, University Studies Abroad Consortium, which is uh, located, the headquarters are in Reno, Nevada, but we are not, um, I'm not a UNR or U Reno, Nevada worker. I work for this consortium of universities, which is a study abroad provider, really. Um, and of course, one of the, my main goals is to assess, you know, the, the linguistic outcomes or language outcomes. And I'm gonna give, give you like, a, a, like an overview of all the um, attempts that I've been doing in the past, I think, 15 years on how to, uh, how to measure and how to evaluate and how to report uh, language outcomes. Uh, let me tell you that this is a very traditional way of uh, measuring language outcomes and um, that's why this is assessment and not research, you know. But we can talk about the difference between assessment and research later on, maybe. Okay, I'm following John Norris when he says that uh, the functions of assessment is to uh, identify needs, to clarify values, allocate resources, design curricula, develop materials, improve delivery. Uh, I'm gonna focus on probably those two functions. Um, demonstrate outcomes, and pr probably the first one, identify the needs. What are we doing right? What are we doing ro wrong in our own institution? Mm -hmm. Also raise awareness. And then the other one is a little bit more, you know, um, transform the lives of the program stakeholders among many other purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another, uh, mm, you know, schema of what um, Bachman and Palmer design of what assessment could be. You know, assessment has to do with evaluation and it can have something that I have discovered <laughs> in these years, intended and unintended consequences, right? Som on the students, on the teachers, on the directors, on the coordinator, on, on the institutions and on the individuals. Um, so uh, our, our our assessment goal uh, is both what is called endogenous, I mean, it, it has to do with the whole institution that wants to see uh, how to improve our practice, how can we do it better, but also it's also uh, exogenous, what means that it's, it comes from the accountability uh, requirement that every institution has. Um, these are the programs that I'm in charge of. So we have like Alicante, San Sebastián, Bilbao, Valencia and Madrid in Spain. So. Um, five programs now, the, the Valencia is the newest one. In Costa Rica we have three programs, in Heredia, Punta Arenas, and San Ramon, and also in Santiago de Chile. And they all have like different, um, you know, peculiarities. They are similar, we have similar uh, language classes. I designed the, the curriculum and the syllabi for all those uh, programs and courses and, and teachers, uh, but I try to respect their own individualities and, and features, you know, well, differences. We have, I mean, we follow, we can, see that in our web page, UNR EDU, but we follow the, the top typical American curriculum, I mean US curriculum, elementary Spanish one and two, intermediate one and two, second year, the third year is usually a composition class in a, in a traditional um, way of viewing this uh, proficiency spectrum. And then we also offer a fourth year or an advanced Spanish uh, one and two. Um, Research, you know, I've been looking at the and reading all the research, and you know, there is um, this consensus, I think, that you know, the narrative abilities and semantic uh, density, according to Collentine, with um, where Barbara Fried was also an author there in the famous SSLA uh, monograph, uh, they, they develop. There's also this fluency, you know, and vocabulary. Uh, Pragmatics is the new field, and there's more recent, um, you know, uh, studies showing about what we were hearing about in the previous presentation about requests, complementing everything. Very interesting. But uh, what I'm going to be—that's why I was saying it's a little bit traditional. What I'm going to be talking about? How about metalinguistic abilities? How about metalinguistic knowledge? You know. Um, morphosyntactic, grammatical abilities, ling however you might fr word it, right? Accuracy, we talk about grammatical accuracy. Hmm? Or metalinguistic abilities, uh, whether it's implicit or explicit, I'm not sure you know, what, which one we want, but that's like the nightmare for, for us as teachers and for the students as well. You know? um, so when we started thinking about how can we assess our outcomes, 
the first idea that came to my mind was why don't we do the placement exam that we had at that time and you know pass it at the end after the four month semester and four month uh, period of study abroad uh, in any of those programs. Our assessment exam or our placement exam sorry <laughs> was an 85 traditional like you have some examples here you know A, B, C, D you know with different forms you know and they have to, to, to find the correct form. It also has some questions on, on vocabulary, idioms, it was very mixed, it didn't, it didn't have like a like from easy questions to more complicated questions, it was very mixed, it was already there when I joined um, USAC and what we found is that you know comparing the pre and post there was uh, statistically significant differences in all, the, in all the courses, of course, the, the beginners didn't take any course, any placement exams because they didn't have any Spanish before. But we also saw that, um, you know, comparing what, you know, they did at the end of our four semesters and what they did after two years of, of uh, Spanish in the universities, in the U.S. universities as a, as a regular rhythm was uh, equi equivalent. There was no significant difference between the ending of, um, you know, at track one, what we call track one, the beginners, and, you know, the students that had studied Spanish for two years in their home institution. So that was, like, very nice, and we, we, I repeated this for uh, two years, and the, the, um, <coughs> the numbers repeated themselves, so I decided to move into something else. So the multiple choice test was very easy to administer, was very easy to interpret, you know, the, but the scores repeated themselves, and what, uh, you know, what does it tell you about how uh, we do well, or we can improve, or wh what, you know, what gaps are there in our courses or in your curriculum? So, basically, you know, what I have here, what does it, this assessment tell us about the efficacy or the efficiency? I don't know if there's any difference between efficacy and efficiency. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there might be, but I'm not sure. Of our language programs, right? Um, so I decided to ask for more like a performance-based assessment. Okay, let's make the students uh, at the beginning and at the end of the semester to write about a trip. Why a trip? Um, because that will trigger, you know, past tense in Spanish, which morphologically is very irregular, and they have to memorize lots of forms and lots of. Um, and there's also like two different tenses, preterite and imperfect. So um, let's see if um, they improved after one semester in Spain, or Costa Rica, or Chile, and there are the significant differences in the way they narrate. Mm -hmm. So this is in Spanish, so uh, this is the, the prompt we gave the students at the beginning and at the end. So I'm sure <coughs> you, you remember some um, vacation, special vacation, in 250 words, tell us how the vacation was, if there was some special anecdote, something bad or good that happened to you during that trip. So 98 students wrote the same composition and at the end and, and the beginning of the semester abroad and at the end. <coughs> level one, as usual, couldn't write anything <laughs> at the beginning. They didn't have any, anything to write on. Um, again, um, easy to collect. You know, the teachers were happy to give that prompt at the beginning and at the end. It, it can easily be incorporated into classroom activities. Um, teachers control for the time and they were told not to give them any help, you know. Course. Um, but for me, it was like complicated to. Um, let me. Um, <coughs> it was complicated to codify. It. I mean, I got like 98 um, per two, so the beginning and at the end. And you know, I was reading about, of course, fluency, complexity, and what is the other thing? Accuracy, of course, numerical accuracy. Mm -hmm. So I came up with some uh, index that could be counted in, the, in, in both compositions at the end and the beginning, and those are the ones that came out significant I during t-test analysis. Uh, in level two, the, those are the students that had one year of Spanish before coming to, sp to Spain or Chile or Costa Rica, and the difference was significant in the number of words, so that means that they were more fluent. They also were more words in each t-unit, mm -hmm. so each sentence and the sentence embedded within them had more words, there were more imp imperfect tenses, forms of imperfect, and the pluperfect appeared. It wasn't before, and it came out in, in the compositions after the study, in the fourth semester of study abroad. Uh, there were more uses of ser and less influence of the L1. So I was counting like direct translations or, you know, like 
to have a good time, to be un buen tiempo. That was a direct translation from English. So there was le a less influence of their English. In level three, of course, no wonder that has to do with <coughs> composition. That's where they write compositions, you know, every almost every day. Lots of themes came out significant, like number of words. There were less uh, in so I what I call incorrect subordinate clauses, which means that even either the nexus or the or the verb form was wrong. There were more types, you know, they were using more types of subordination. So the, the sentences were longer, more complex, and with more uh, n mm, conjunctions, we call them, right? They were more imperfect, as in track two, uh, and they were also the pluperfect form, and, and fewer incorrect verb forms. So the, the morphology came out better, you know, and fewer incorrect uses of ser. What happened in track four? Nothing. <laughs> and I was like, what? Nothing? So the students that had already like three years of Spanish that went to any of those countries and wrote a composition about the trip at the beginning and then at the end, <laughs> I couldn't tell the difference. Uh, I, of course, I share all the you know, assessment results with the teachers in multiple uh, meetings and um, we, well, we discussed there could be a ceiling effect, you know, maybe they knew so much that, you know, talking, recounting a trip is not a very hard task for a <coughs> person who has studied Spanish for three years. The task was too simple. Uh, or maybe we should review our track four curriculum. That's why I said Spanish four. And we did both things, really. I mean, I repeated, I don't have time to talk about other tasks. I, I did something that was more na than a narrative, more like an argumentative task. And then their fluency came out significant. Um, some other thing, uh, maybe the nexus were more elaborated, uh, subjunctive nothing, there was no improvement of the subjunctive <coughs> mood. But we, that was a good, you know, stopping point to, okay, let's think about our, our advanced course, how can we make it better, how can we improve it, you know, with the readings, with projects, we incorporated several projects. Um, and then the next step was, okay, but Maybe I have a very narrow minded of, of what language is, right? I'm always worried about accuracy and grammar and morphosyntax. What if we design a task that can, you know, give us an account of more the the whole experience, you know? Because I you know, the teachers kept telling me, oh, but you know, it's not only if they use this verb form well or not, there's much more in, in study abroad as you all know, right? And I designed this, um, this narrative episode, I call it a narrative episode, and I give them the prompt in, in English this time. That's another thing that I keep, you know, changing my mind. <laughs> Should we give the instructions in English or in Spanish? You know, most of them are American. Sometimes we get from other people, students from other nationalities, but the majority are from U.S. universities. And, you know, influenced by all the, the readings on, on teacher education, really, about critical incidents, you know, things that all of a sudden is like a, an epiphany, something that, wow, oh, well, this is so, I'm learning so much, or this is changing my life, right? Uh, I asked them to explain uh, what critical facts, incidents, or crucial people. Of course, most of them decided to talk about people, and they didn't know what a critical incident was, maybe. Or they had a, hard, a very hard time thinking of one. There were, there were a couple that actually could come up with some very important anecdotes of moments that you say, oh my goodness, I've learned so much, I feel so much confident now. <coughs> that were very, very important for us. Um, again, 250 words, and the teacher will deliver it. So they were done pen and pencil. The, the usual, we don't do, comp that's another thing that in study abroad you cannot rely on computer labs like here, you know, like these fancy universities. Our universities are much more modest, much more, um, you cannot, I cannot tell them, oh, you have to go to the lab and you type them so that I, <laughs> no, I type it them, them myself, all of them, <laughs> all, the, all the compositions, which is not a bad thing because you can see all the, you know, the doubts that they have, things that they erased, they changed, they modified. So um, these are what came out from these um, <coughs> critical incident or, or the reflective na uh, narrative that I call um, one thing that I noticed and I discussed with all the teachers, you know, is there was um, an overuse of, of a star over a ser. Even, even in, uh, wait, this, is, this is level one, you know, this is a very um, um, low proficiency student, but even in, in, in the thir third, <coughs> look, at, look at this, this student, right, how he or she is hesitating. Sometimes to be ser, estar, fue, estaba. Eh? And look at all the things that 
and and he he ended or she ended up with estaba difícil. Huh? So when they have to adjust something, they keep using estar. You know, it was very it was very patient estar. Uh, it's been very interesting estar. <coughs> hmm? So there's an overuse of estar. They they they, they the, all of a sudden they discover this estar and they use it all over. You know? <laughs> And, but not in any any uh, function. It's with the function of judging something, you know. And we discussed this with the with the teachers that we have, we have to pay more attention to this. Another thing that um, caught my attention was, y we as I was telling you, sp Spanish you know has a lot of um, irregular endings and forms, and it changes according to the person. And, and the morphology is, is very very complicated and and it's hard for them. And we don't pay attention to non-final forms, the, just the plain infinitive or gerund that doesn't change that much. And uh, I noticed that there were still mistakes, you know, in, in, in even in, in advanced courses of uh, using, as the previous one, uh, the gerund instead of an infinitive, or using a preposition where there shouldn't be one. Mm -hmm. So we discussed that with all the teachers, and we are paying extra uh, attention to these non-finite verb forms. Mm? Again, they're using this, um, this <coughs> preposition that shouldn't be there, mm? an extra preposition. On the other side, uh, I noticed that when they were approaching to the penis uh, peninsula variety, and they were using the present tense in, in all the compositions, you know, um, all the people that I've met, all the things that I have learned, mm? so very, very well, everything that has in influenced my process. I mean, and then, um, of course, one thing that I also saw that there was a lot of overlapping information with course evaluations. You know, they, they value the teachers as a very, very important person in that, uh, like mediators with the, with the uh, host culture. I also did like a preliminary content analysis of all the compositions, and I could see that, that you know, in level one, you know, the, the, the lower the proficiency, the more they rely on the class and the teachers, you know, they say fantastic things about them. Um, they also talk about the conversation partners, mm? and these are the numbers, you know. Out of 37 compositions, 11 mention the conversation partner, 32 their teachers, and also the teaching English, you know, this internship that they have or volunteer in, in schools. Um, in the second level, again, class and teachers. You can see class and teachers, class and teachers, and then the family in, in the most advanced students, you know, they're much independent from the classroom, the ones that have the higher proficiency. Huh? But the class and teacher are still here, you know, eight out of 18. Conversation partner, and then, you know, the family is here, you know, in the level four on, or in level two. So uh, those are, as I was telling you before, it's mostly the, the people that are around them, the one that they care about. Um, so this end of, I of course, this is a composition that cannot have like a pre and post, like the one of the narration. It has to be done at the end, you know. And it allows us to document both students' Spanish performance and also aspects that they value of that experience. Um, but it does not allow us to document the progress that they do, huh? unless they are like elementary and or zero Spanish, and we can document what they can do at the end. Hmm? It's, that's also a composition or a task that does not interfere with the classroom practice or pace, hmm? and it can be easily integrated in class. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, one thing that is also debated in, in the literature is whether the students should reflect in their, in their, you know, native language or the strong language or in the second language. And I remember when I had this, the, 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 teacher, the meetings with the teachers, some of the teachers told me, but this is too hard to do in Spanish, you know, for students that are starting to study the language. And, and it was not. I mean, they could reflect and they like to reflect. With all the mistakes that you've seen, I mean, the, the previous things had a lot of mistakes, but, but still, they can do it and they like it and they enjoy it, you know. And I think it's a very, I think that's where, you know, study abroad is, is going through the more, more reflection and more um, awareness of what's going on. Um, however, again, <laughs> for me, it requires a lot of time of codification, analysis that cannot be done every single semester. So um, I don't have much time, but um, f to finish this circle, remember that I started with the placement exam as an assessment exam, then I did the narration composition, then I did the, this reflexive composition, which was great, very interesting. 
I'm moving back to the placement exam, and now we have a, a, a new placement exam, uh, which is um, which is done, which has been redone. You know, has been renewed. The one that I was using before was already there. Now uh, I've been working in a new placement exam that we can review in and change in. Mm -hmm. uh, we took. I, I don't know if you noticed. Well, you probably didn't notice because this is too fast, but. In the, in, the, in the previous exam, the one we had like 10 years ago, there was a lot of vosotros, you know, there were pe peninsular um, items of the peninsular variety. And we changed that and we tried to make an, a, a, like a pan-Hispanic or, or the more um, global Spanish that we can think of, you know, that we were aware of. There are still things that, you know, happen that are, come from peninsular Spanish, but we took uh, we took the, the vosotros and, and vocabulary like piso, like apartment that is peninsular Spanish. Um, present perfect was also uh, avoided. Mm. Um, the quest instead of having like 85 questions random, you know, randomly organized, we have what we call in Spanish we call it ramos. I don't know. I didn't know how to translate this. So the the, the first 15 questions are like first year Spanish, the second one will be like more second year Spanish, the third one like more complex. Um, so it, it grows in its difficulty, let's put it that way. Um, I, I work with all the teachers to come up with the items, you know how hard it is to, to design uh, a place, an exam with questions and you know things, I, um, distractors as they call them, you know, <laughs> things that could ha be, uh, you know, could tell you something. Um, we pilot the test in, in paper, in pen and pencil, huh? and it gave me a lot of information on things that could, could be too hard or too difficult or too easy. Hmm? By January, you know, last month, we had like more like 669 student responses. Those are this, this is when it was working as a placement, hmm? as a placement. And uh, items were classified according to their facility or difficulty, how you might call it. Hmm? This is an example, you know, for um, I cannot do it myself. <laughs> so the distractors were, you know, pl again, played more, more with the morphosyntactic, you know, whether the clitic is attached to the, um, at the end of the verb or in the beginning, or, you know, me ayudas or ayudes, you know, very subtle things. Mm. So this tells you, you know, me, uh, no me ayudes, this is the correct form. And there was like 234 questions. So the I item difficulty is 36%, which is pretty high, you know. <coughs> Um, so again, how about a placement exam as an assessment tool? What kind of information can it give me? And this is more or less, this is a combination of all, all the, all the um, sites results. And I don't do it this well, I don't report it this way. Usually I report, you know, the, the results in each, uh, in each group. So I go to San Sebastian, I have a meeting with the teachers and I tell them, okay, these are our results. Uh, what happened with the people that are down here? You know, what went wrong with them? And usually there is correspondence between the students that were left behind and the grades. Hmm? They should be, you know, because we, we don't, you know, we don't have perfect scores. You know, we have people who fail and those in, in, the, in the results would be, in the lower. So instead of, uh, you know, so this is the one that I started from the beginning. So um, some people, I mean, most of the people are here. So that means that they did four groups of um, these 15 questions correctly. Mm -hmm. This, this, this uh, orange here is a perfect score, you know, and actually, you know, they, they should be, everybody should be in this perfect score, but it's, they're not. So usually this, this, um, these ones are the ones that have lower grades you know, or bad grades. Hmm? But um, well this I've, I've done this two, for two semesters, the last uh, spring and, and fall. And these are also very, um, you know, it tells us a lot about whether some programs are, you know, are strong in, in the, in the, maybe in, at, the, at the higher level or at the low level or, you know, and I also have this course for individual teachers. So it gives you a lot of information on how the program is, is moving along. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it's easy to administer, easy to grade. Mm -hmm. Some teachers uh, have used them also as a learning tool. Um, that's the other thing, you know. We are moving towards uh, having assessment online as well. So we do placement, assess placement online, of course, because they are in the United States. And we get the results in Spain or in Chile or in Costa Rica, you know, with this Google course questionnaire. But how do we do the assessment? Um, 
I'm very traditional and I like the idea of you know talking to my students and see using this assessment also s for something that could be useful for them, not only for me as a coordinator or for the administration, but also for the students, you know. And sometimes when they do it on, in pen and pencil, they say, oh, yeah, that's right, I made this mistake, it should have been this way because of blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the assessment that is done in class in pen and paper works as a, as a review thing at, for them. So, um, so if it is administered it, with pen and pencil, teachers can use it as a learning tool. If it is done online, it's, my life is much simpler. You know, I get the results in an Excel page, do, 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 perfect. It's, but it, you, you understand what I mean, right? It's, but it doesn't have this learning, uh, I think, it, can, it cannot be used as a learning tool for the teachers and for the students. Um, well, the result for each program has been shared, discussed with the teachers. You know, why is everybody got this answer wrong? What's going on? We should improve this better. Um, it can be used as an additional information. It's also, you know, for students who are which, which are in the lower end, so, uh, well, it has to correspond with bad grades, and if it, it doesn't, what is the problem, you know? Um, so we have adopted this multiplism perspective, I, I would like to see, of on language assessment, something that Sohami and Inbar 2006 already said. Uh, I think we have to look, you know, at, at this metalinguistic or grammatical accuracy, knowledge or ability from multiple perspectives, you know, um, with multiple criteria for determining language ability. And I think what is more important in USAC, we are creating this culture of assessment hmm, um, among language teachers. At the beginning it was like, why are we doing this? What is the point of all this? Hmm? And I so, said, okay, I think little by little they're understanding that we have to look our, our practice from a critical standpoint and things that things that are well and things that need to be improved and changed, you know, um, and abandoning the idea of a con control instrument, you know. Uh, this is a little summary of, you know, all the, the instruments that I've been using, the test one, the test two, the narration, the reflection, uh, and some thought, you know, what could help for students, for teachers, for me, and for outside uh, stake uh, stakeholders, you know, the people that ask us, so how are you doing? And I can show this data to them. And, and it's, um, it's some, some are better interpreted than others. You know, the narration, I, th I thought, was very hard for me to, to review and understand because it's, it, it got too technical, you know, the fluency, the accuracy, the T units. It's like, I remember one person that told me, T units is not English. You know, do you not speak good English? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> T units is not <laughs> English, is right. Um, what are we going towards? But that's why I came to this conference. <laughs> if you have ideas of what else could be done, you know, um, that would be great to, to discuss um, maybe in the question or, or maybe with you guys. And these are the references in case I see you would like to. Okay, thank you.